so I think I'm live now. Uh, hello, every, everyone, and thank you for being here. Uh, it's a bit strange to talk to myself because I'm looking at my own face, and that's a bit disconcerting. So bear with me till I get used to uh, looking at myself while talking. Um, thank you so much uh, to the Creative Documentary Center, to Samira Jain, to Bhasmang, to Malika for uh, inviting me to give this. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to give a talk, but I'm going to try and share my work and try and speak about my work. Um, I said yes to uh, Samira right away because I was quite excited about talking. And then I realized that now I have to do the tough work of sitting back, viewing my work, reflecting on it, and thinking about what exactly it is that I want to say about um, my work as a documentary filmmaker. And, and uh, what I found was I was most comfortable talking about my process. I really don't know what animal my film becomes by the end of it. Um, but the one thing that I feel very connected to and extremely um, enriched by is, is the process. And again, it's, it's now that I can look back uh, and really make sense of that process. Because you know, when you are in the, in the middle of making a film, it's really uh, something that you go through. Um, very uh, organically. It's, you, you don't quite know uh, where you're headed. At least I'm the kind of person who was very committed to the idea of not knowing where I'm headed. So I want to actually begin by um, reading a note, uh, a, a, a quote actually from uh, David McDougall, who is both an academic and a filmmaker. Um, and in his book, his essays on cinema, anthropology, and documentary filmmaking, I found a quote that, in a sense, helped me really unpack for myself what my process has been over the last 20 years and 13 films. And uh, I think it sort of spoke to me. So the, the quote that I want to read is this. Uh, Film invites us to enter into a particular experiential space with a subject. To the extent that it is experimental, its aim is to find out what filming can reveal about the subject. To the extent that it is analytical, it is to describe and explain it. And to the extent that it is embodied, it is to insist on another way of knowing it. Now, the reason why this, this quote actually uh, seemed an important way to reflect on, on my work and process was that I've actually been through all three stages at different points of time, with different kinds of film, and at different stages of my own work. So I think when I began, let me start with where I began. I began by wanting to make documentary films early on, even before I joined film school, which is the Film and Television Institute of India. In the FTII, one was so immersed and so completely, uh, uh, very beautifully immersed in fiction narrative filmmaking that for the time being, I had kept documentary and my, uh, other than being a viewer, I had kept that aspiration out of the picture for a while. So immediately after film school, when I was eager to start working on, on a film, I think I very organically went to documentary filmmaking. And, uh, well, it was it was documentary films as an undergrad student that led me to filmmaking in the first place. I was an avid film watcher. Uh, every film, whether good, bad, or ugly, one as a family we watched. But I think uh, I decided I wanted to be a filmmaker after I saw a set of documentary films, Indian documentary films, uh, as an undergrad student. And uh, so when I started out as wanting to make a documentary film, I imagined it would be analytical to describe and to explain it. And that is uh, the understanding of documentary I had. That is, that is what spoke back to me. But I suspect because of being trained in a particular way at the Film Institute, um, 
I somehow organically went to the third part of this quote, which is uh, to the extent that it is embodied, it is to insist on another way of knowing it. Now, this is something I can say in hindsight. It's not when I, when I began work, uh, when I began my research, uh, the, the idea was that I would be going towards the analytical. And I'd like to speak a little now about my process. Um, so again, to come back to my first film, I'm going to dwell a bit on my first film before I really go into uh, drawing out a meaning uh, or a reflection on all my work. Uh, when I came out of film school, one of the first things I wanted to do uh, was get away from a certain uh, idea that is upheld in the film school very highly, which is that the only honest story that you can tell is about yourself and your experience. And while that was very compelling and that was very beautiful to watch others do that, I somehow, uh, when I came out of film school, wanted to go back to my ex experience of wanting to use the camera to engage with the world outside and not just the world in general, but actually my city, which is Bombay. Um, so I began with a set of questions. When I began my first film, and I began uh, working on a documentary that is called uh, Jari Mari of Cloth and Other Stories, um, I began by asking a set of questions to myself. And those questions motivated a kind of research that one can now call secondary research, which was basically reading up, um, meeting whether it was journalists, economists, activists, academics, anthropologists, uh, labor historians, to really uh, fatten myself up on understanding uh, what is the meaning of informalization of labor in Bombay. Uh, informalization of labor was a process that everybody was talking about at a time when Publicly, what we were celebrating was that Bombay was no longer a manufacturing city. It was now um, going to be a global city, and it was now the financial se center, and uh, it had the service sector, but not manufacturing. So I wanted to understand what happened to manufacturing. And from my secondary research, what I understood, of course, was that the manufacturing shifted from factories into sweatshops. So I, I wanted to understand what this process is about. The only way I knew how to understand it after I had done my secondary research. The secondary research, I think, equipped me to start figuring a way to see, and more importantly, a way to listen. Uh, with these two tools in my head, and without a very specific idea of what this film is going to be, I went into a space, I went into a community, and I began um, listening. I, I, I was actually piggybacking on a friend of mine who was a researcher. And she was conducting these long interviews with women in a particular uh, um, a, a basti, a slum, uh, behind the international airport in Mumbai. And uh, its name uh, is Jari Mari. And she was doing her own research. And I used to tag along with her just just tagging along. I had no question of my own. And that that went on for a very long period, primarily because I never I, I didn't have the means to start making my film. So my research stage got expanded uh, beyond my own expectation. And I think that was critical in establishing a certain relationship that I had with research, where um, I go into the field, I I'm curious and I'm alert to the moment by moment experience. And in a sense, these became my field notes. But when I entered the same space with the camera, rather than build on those film notes, uh, or not film notes, sorry, on those field notes, to have a film firmly and surely in my mind, I found it somehow far more meaningful to go back to my field notes and to almost go back to that space where I was back to just being curious and alert to the moment by moment experience by uh, talking to people. But uh, there were a bunch of people in that space that I would keep going back to. And these were women who I had 
no interview question for. What I would do is start a conversation and let the conversation roll, get a life of its own. Uh, my interview questions were around all the workspaces I went to where people were working to, to try and understand the, the meaning of what is informal work and what are its implications. So now between these very interview, interview type questions and between these long rambling conversations, um, I, I did not know how, how I was going to bridge the two, but what I found myself with my crew doing, and they were, they were enthusiastic participants in this. Um, we were all, it was our first film for all of us. So I think they, there was a far more openness about being uh, engaged without quite knowing what we were doing. And in that moment is, I think, when we began uh, exploring the space and exploring the space, exploring the rhythm of that space. By rhythm, I mean, uh, again, these are all words I'm using in retrospect to what I was doing. But at that time, I could not fully comprehend how these conversations and these interviews were embedded in that space. And I needed a grounding for that. And in that, I kept going back to the same space, uh, observing it over time. And we kept filming this kind of material uh, with a certain idea that, of course, these are just going to be the shots that sort of join things together. But uh, again, to talk about my relation relationship with research, I think these field notes that were my footage uh, in my editing space, uh, in the editing room, went back to being uh, a new kind of research. Now, suddenly, it was my field notes that I had, it, had to engage with. Um, what is my film was a question that I had left far behind. What is the meaning of the fact that this space that has this woman um, who is working in a particular kind of a sweatshop, how do I contextualize what she has said? Uh, how she has interrupted my question and where she has taken me to? You know, so um, it, was a, it, it was a process of... Uh, trying to make sense of um, what is my research and what is my film. And the more work we did in the editing room, the more I was interested in the research part that was not holding together neatly, that was not fitting together into a clean kind of uh, 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 structure. But my choice of structure uh, was somehow located in uh, the walking through in those spaces that I did. Um, I, um, I, I don't know if I'm, I'm very clear about it. I think it might be good to actually go into a clip at this point in time. And then it might be clearer what I'm trying to say. So I'll just begin with my first clip. This is a uh, in the latter part of the first film that I made, uh, Jari Mari of Cloth and Other Stories. And uh, I will just... Either of the Bambu, either of the other, either of the other, either by it. Ah, Dragon at Dragon, you're 
या अच्छे से डब्बा था नीचे थोड़ा राशन वगैरह रख लिया था जी कपड़े और कपड़े थोड़े धो के डाले थे हम लोग क्या लगता भाई तक हम बारिश भर जाएंगे इसलिए तो सामान ऊपर रखा हुआ है तो इसके लिए आपको ऊपर है जो भी तो भैया कहा क्या बोलते हैं पानी लाइट का या कोई चोर लोग बन तो उसी में काम आ जाएंगे और वो गद्दी वगैरह जो नीचे थी वह गो क्या करेंगे पानी भर के क्या करोगे अरे मत करते हुए फिर आपकी तबीयत आजकल कैसी रहती है घबराहट हो रही है क्या करें कमर में दर्द देगा ये हाथ पाँव दर्द देगा एकदम कभी गल जा रहे हाथ काम लगा तो एकदम थोड़ा ताकत आती थी पैसे आते शाम को अस्सी रुपया सत्तर रुपया पैसे आते आराम से तरकारी चावल शक्कर पत्ती पत्ती हाथ आ रहा था तो हाथ पो नहीं गलते अब जब काम मिल रहा है तो हाथ पो नहीं गलते क्या करेंगे घर में आते दिमाग काट हो रहा हम घबराहट हो रही है बच्चे लोग खाना मांगे अब क्या करो ऊपर से डॉक्टर को बाहर से डॉक्टर साहब मेरे हाथ पों गल गए हम घबराहट हो रही और उनको मालूम है हम लोग काम करते काम बंद है खाला बोलो क्या बोलो वो तो आपको काम नहीं लग रहे जो तुमको घबराहट हो रही नाथ को गाड़े बोले ये गोली है बोले जाओ खाना खा ये गोली खा तुझसे इंजेक्शन इंजेक्शन बोले वो बोले आपका लड़का काम कर रखा लगे घबरा नहीं जाती है हाथ को गला के लिए लेने का क्यों ऐसे करे ये बस्ती तोड़ने की बात कर रहे इसलिए क्या मालूम कुछ बच्चे तो पूरे बम्बई के अंदर नंबर डाले अभी जब वो काम नहीं करें देंगे तो हम गरीब लोग क्या खाने कहीं भी कर दिया खाने बम ऊपर से फेंक दो साफ मैं तो वही बता रही कुछ भी छोड़ दो बम गरीब जिसके पास घर में पैसा दे लाए जो नौकरे आए उनको जिसको कंपनी में जिसके पास हर चीज़ है कारोबार वो लोग खाएंगे जब हम मजदूर करके आना जब खाना मर्ची बजे हमने खाए जब हमारे को काम है तो हम लोग ने क्या खाने क्या खाने मर जाने इससे पता है हमारे गरीबों की जो प्रपति देखे हमने खाने बम छोड़ आराम से सोचिए तुम लोग को भी लोग Uh, so this this is a clip from uh, Jari Mari of Cloth and other stories, as I as I mentioned. And uh, the reason I wanted to uh, I wanted to show this clip is because this is one of the few moments. It's a it's a seventy five minute long film, but this is one of the very few moments where there was this uh, very uh, strong and very sharp sense of uh, affect. Um, uh, this lady whom we used to all she was called khala by everybody and so we called her khala as well um very very uh, you know talking about something else suddenly went into this very sharp very uh, uh, like like a extremely sharp kind of anger flash of anger and uh, so we were a bit taken aback even while while filming but the important thing was while editing um we had to figure what does this moment mean um i was not invested and was in fact very anxious about these very dramatic moments which there were many that we had filmed but these were the these these very dramatic sharp moments were the ones that i was wary of because it it built a certain narrative of drama that that bothered me and uh, my editor and i uh, my editor uh, was uh, jabeen merchant for this film and the cinematogra cinematographer was uh, setu and uh, the sound recorder was jissi michael um so it was a it was a very uh, tight team we we worked very closely together but i think with jabeen the conversations that i kept uh, having was how can we embed this moment without this moment taking over everything else around um the interview goes on for a little longer and her she gets sharper in what she's saying but the important thing is that that flash of anger disappears and and we go back to a rhythm of of going about your daily activities so to reach up to this moment i had to i i, I it was very important for me to go back to my rushes which were and my field notes and pull out all the moments where nothing is happening but there's a certain rhythm of day to day mundane back to back work uh of of living that is happening and within that to so to make that the more 
important part of the film rather than this very articulate and very sharp moment of anger. So, uh, you know, here I actually want to read out uh, another quote by David McDougall. I'm a big fan of him as a filmmaker and uh, uh, reading his work so many years later has actually uh, made a lot of sense to me, not just about his own films, but given me some way in which to reflect on my own work. So the, the quote I want to read is this. Um, Here the outcome is unpredictable and open to sudden shifts of direction. To work in this way often means entrusting yourself to strangers and there's always a risk of becoming a stranger to yourself. That, uh, but for the filmmaker, it is more than a calculated risk. It is a voluntary act of dislocation. Um, this act of dislocation and retrospect is perhaps what I was working towards and what I'm constantly, I continue to work towards. Um, in my earlier films, by making my process of research the films, uh, I keep reiterating that in the, on the editing table, uh, my, my scraps of field notes that weren't tying together somehow made the bulk and the body of my film. And the more crystallized moments had to be embedded in that. The, the only analysis I could come up with was through this embodiment of people speaking. I could not dislocate them from a certain uh, context, a certain physicality of space, and a certain temporality of that space. Um, so uh, the, the, uh, in my earlier films, by making a process of research, the film, I was selecting and creating a structure to best represent that search. This necessitated analysis, uh, selection. In a way, I think research overlapped our editing process. It was through the editing process that I was able to analyze my raw data, much like what an anthropologist would do with her field notes. Um, I very specifically use the word anthropologist. I am no anthropologist. I did an anthropology in my undergrad uh, college and so can lay no claim to either being an ethnographer or an anthropologist. But I have a feeling somewhere along the way in which that training gave me a way to uh, enter a space that is not mine. Uh, to be able to, somehow it gave me the tools to start being curious. Um, my rushes became my field notes. And my films are an attempt at bringing together my field notes into a structure that includes a certain analysis of the subject, but also the film form. Here, again, I want to come back to my quote. Uh, it was absolutely essential for me to have, and you know, when I was choosing my clips, I had imagined I would choose clips that were one and a half to two minutes long, but I could not because everything that I wanted to say had to be seen in that context of just the space within which that that person has said what she has said, but what's going on in, in, in that space. Um, and that was essential. So the fact that there is rain and then there are people working and it's the rhythm of work that leads us to Kala, who uh, I had gone to visit to ask about her work actually. And she uh, took me into another di uh, direction. And as a, again, to come back to the quote, this act of dislocation is what was absolutely essential to informing my filmmaking. Um, I was constantly working to make the film form reflect ambiguities, confusion, complexities. Uh, finding my film did not involve crystallizing meaning and sharpening a thesis. Uh, the complexity and confusion was perhaps my thesis. I had to figure a way for the audience to enter that zone and not leave the film having got the story. The multiple strands tightly wound together could not be teased out and shown separately uh, in the process creating abstraction but by showing them in the way they are knotted together and linked to one another. Uh, the film had created a trace of what I had seen, heard, experienced, felt. This, this process of that I use in all my films, this has actually formed my political understanding of who I am and the world I live in. I don't make films because I have something to say. I'm uh, constantly being asked by my, my friends who are always my crew, so what is the film? And I. I actually have a lot of mumbling and fumbling that I do, but I don't have a clear answer. I'm constantly trying to find ways 
to expand my understanding of this complicated world we are part of. In small, tiny corners, there are people everywhere who expand my vision. Um, I want to go to one more clip of from Jari Mari. And, uh, you know, this is a clip that's earlier on in the film. And again, I think this, this clip, I'm hoping, uh, makes clear what I mean by this dislocation. Uh, the, the, the clip begins at while I was talking to women about this uh, informal work. By informal work, I also mean uh, contract, contracted work. So, so production process in Bombay had shifted from factories and gone into uh, the production process being broken down into a series of contracted work. So I was with a bunch of women doing one part, uh, absolutely invisible, obscure part of a production process of automobile parts. And from there, I had to go to uh, one of the women who I constantly go back to through the film. And in the structuring of my film, it was imperative that I don't go from talking about work here to talking about work to the other lady who was, quote unquote, a kind of a character. Um, the space within which both these sets of women were located was for me actually the story or the film. So um, I'm just going to go to my second clip. This also is taking some time. अभी सात रुपये होएगा तो हम किलो के पीछे दस किलो के पीछे सत्तर रुपये भी कमाते पर मिलना मांगता है दस किलो माल ऐसे कंपनी से नाम आई थी कहते हैं बनियों कच्ची ताकत में आते हैं ना ये बग ये बग दाखा होती है खाली पड़ल माती आशी डाकून पर जब अपने फिरूंगे ये बग आशी ना हम्बा बगैर अच्छा सुन ट्रोकान आप कितने साल पहले आए हैं आपने? तो इधर आप इन्हें बोलते हैं इस साल की माँ है। शादी करके बंबई आए हैं कि उससे पहले आए हैं? नहीं, शादी करके बंबई आया मैं। इससे पहला नहीं। शुरू शुरू में बंबई कैसा लगा जब आए? गांव के हिसाब से। वही ना नया नया एकदम। नहीं गांव के हिसाब से? बहुत बेकार। � बोरा गई ना ये इतना ऊंचा घर घर देख देख के सो आई वांट टू कम बैक टू टॉकिंग अबाउट व्हाई स्पेस एंड इस इस द द स्पेस इन विच आई वाज डूइंग माय रिसर्च 
was constantly becoming more and more important. Um, I kept working towards making that space three dimensional. That did not mean shooting the same space from different, different angles and different magnifications. I became invested in understanding the space over time. It was meant to be my research process, understanding what it means to look for work on a daily basis. But then one downpour, a break in a water pipe or announcement of demolitions can throw daily wage out of the window. But that precarity was not easily evident in in my in in the interviews. And because I wasn't pushing that that precarity as the subject of my interviews, uh, I had to figure another way to bring that in. It was during my research and initial scripting that I found my search research constantly dislocated. It was a dislocation that gave heft to my research. I was going further away from any idea of the story and getting immersed in details that somehow seemed to me to take me closer to both meaning and understanding. I've usually been the novice trying to follow events that evaded me to understand people who knew each other and their space much better than I knew them. Uh, was this observational cinema? I don't know. Because the camera crew observing was constantly interrupted with me seeking meaning from the people I filmed. Um, Tai, the lady that you saw in the second clip, um, there's this beautiful moment where we were just there quietly observing her do her work with her son. And um, it was beautiful, but I knew that I, I had to come in and ask questions. And that's totally anathema to observational cinema. But uh, I felt it was my responsibility to the space and to the people I was filming to let them speak and not just me observe. And not just for them to speak, but to also explain and to include the fact that we needed them to explain it to us. Uh, the audience had to be privy to that process of my hesitation, errors, their repetitions, their impatience with me, their patience with me, their generosity. It was a certain responsibility to the person observed and the space inhabited by us, however briefly. I had to attempt to create a certain integrity in terms of time and a three-dimensionality of space to listen and to let the subject speak with her full body and presence. Um, I want to now show a clip from a film that I made in 2004. It's called Above the Din of Sewing Machines. Uh, Jarimari uh, led me to make this film. I moved to Bangalore after making this film in Bombay and a group of uh, activists who were trying to unionize garment workers approached me after seeing Jarimari and asked me to, to document the work they were doing trying to unionize women. Um, I want to show uh, the, the last sequence from that film because this, this, this I think it so, somehow explains this concept that I'm keeping on harping on this three dimensionality of space and letting people in that space somehow tell me and inform me rather than me um, finding ways to uh, figure it out myself. Um,
because I'm as expected running out of time before I have shown everything I wanted to show. I'm going to jump through some clips. Um, but here again, uh, I think uh, for me, this, this sequence was very important also because in Jari Mari, there was a certain way in which I was filming and understanding how to film work. And by this film, I, um, I think my manner of looking and my manner of research had sort of expanded. Um, I was, I was, I was able to inhabit a space alongside um, the people I was filming and to sort of understand it uh, better. The kind of, you know, uh, we were there to shoot people entering a factory. I thought it was a very functional, uh, descriptive kind of shooting we would do. And it would be an interesting way to, to begin the film or end it or whenever I needed a pause. And instead, what we found was that, and we had collected a lot of stories of the kind of, uh, uh, in, like, the kind of harassment that goes on inside these uh, garment factories uh, that were producing branded goods. Um, but, you know, so I had loads and loads of interviews of women talking about what that experience was like. But standing outside at 8.45 in the morning, filming people going to work. And as the clock came closer to nine and the kind of panic with which women started running towards the gate. Um, and and the way that somehow made me understand every interview that I did better. Uh, you know, there is a description of, of, of fear and there is somehow that evidence of that fear that um, seemed to seem to charge the story very, very differently. Um, I want to go now to one more concept, as you can see, uh, as I, when I had come out of film school, there was loads of concepts that were stuck in our head, but there were many I held, held on to very preciously. Uh, and another of these precious phrases was André Bazin's uh, cinema of duration. Um, I was trying to constantly understand what what does this phrase mean for me? What does it mean in my practice? And I think I came closest to starting to engage with this idea when I began um, working on music. Um, in 2004, uh, to, uh, yeah, 2004, I went to Jamaica and Trinidad with uh, Tejaswini Niranjana and a motley group of us. Uh, Ramani was uh, the, the cinematographer and Suresh Rajamani was the sound recordist. Um, the three of us went along with this, this project of Tejaswini Niranjanas and we were filming music in the Caribbean, in Jamaica and Trinidad. And unlike all my other films where I could actually inhabit the space for a long time before I went with the camera crew, here I was going to be filming in a space that was totally unfamiliar to me and the day we landed was the day we started filming. So again, I had pages and pages and pages of field notes that I came back to. It took me two years of editing and I really called editing at that point my research stage. It was when I was looking through the rushes that I was able to understand what was the material uh, we filmed. And that shifted me into understanding what it means to structure a film where uh, there's a certain duration, a, a certain rhythm that music imposes. And can that tell the story? Not just the, not just the lyrics, not just the performance space, but can, can, can duration be understood differently now that I was working with one more layer, which was music. So music, in a sense, took over this idea of space that I held very clear to me in my previous films. Um, I'm unfortunately not going to be able to show, I've run out of time, but I can't show a clip from Jahaji music, but I want to show a clip from Bidesi and Bombay, where I want to pick up on an idea I spoke about earlier about dislocation. By now, I was coming closer to this idea of how is my film language helping me analyze my research and, and, and express my research. So by Bidesi and Bombay, again, because of the kind of work and collaboration I did with my sound designer, uh, Mohandas VP, there was a certain idea of how can this performance space or the performer again, be embedded in a space and how can I use dislocation of sound to bring all these ideas together? So I'm going to sort of end with this clip and open it out to, to, to questions. 
Um, हेलो अब आइए जिसका इंतजार वो है सुप्रिया जी आप सबके बीच अपने मृतकों के डांस को लेकर के आ रही हैं सुप्रिया जी जोरदार ताली फीडिंग से ले ले सुप्रिया जी So this is from my film uh, Desia in Bombay, which is looking at uh, the production and performance of Bhojpuri music in Bombay. Uh, the film is more a way of yet again understanding Bombay, Mumbai, uh, Bombay, rather than while it is Bhojpuri music that is sort of driving the film forward. Uh, but I I began inhabiting the music and the performance spaces. and the singers right not their lives but the, the 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 singers ways of engaging with the city and the music uh, to really uh, uh talk about what is this migrant experience what what is this experience of a migrant in the city and uh, i found that i sort of restricted myself to shooting in these performance uh, spaces at night or the places where music was being produced uh, and or uh, you know where where the the producers and the music organizers would sort of meet to to discuss uh, their plans and what i found was that 
I I needed to go to stay within that space and to start thinking of ways of dislocating sound to to give a body back to the people who are in that mass. So I could have gone and interviewed the dancer, but I didn't know. I didn't think that was going to be very useful. Uh, I could have gone and filmed the people uh, and interviewed people in the audience. Um, again, that did not seem like. In fact, I did have some interviews, but it did not seem like it was telling me anything. So how could I stay within that space and try and give body to people who otherwise become, uh, in a sense, just cardboard, two-dimensional uh, people because it's such a such a large mass. Um, so I think I should absolutely end over here because I have gone way beyond. But um, I think some of the ideas I, I'd like to open up, and I'd love to hear your questions and your 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 comments on this. Is um, you know how how can we think about films that seem to sort of meander rather than make a very clear concerted point? Um, and how can we use film form to further accentuate that exploration? Uh, I'm, I'm like my films. I'm not sure this talk is 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 very focused and clear. But I'm hoping that now we can uh, take in questions. I had one more one and a half minute clip uh, from a recent film of mine, but uh, I'm going to hold on to that and see if we can bring it up later. Um, uh, I'm going to try and see the questions. Um, so what is the kind of creativity that is not exploitative, artificial, synthetic in documentary narratives? Where does one draw the line and attempt a creative engagement with reality? So um, Antara, um, I, so the, uh, one, I'm not sure uh, the, my, my act of filmmaking is, is that creative, but uh, uh, I think the issues that you raise about how can one try and step or at least be aware of what is exploitative, what is artificial, what is synthetic. Uh, I think that awareness uh, is, is what is important. Uh, at what point might you think that what I did was exploitative, artificial or synthetic is really uh, open-ended and is not is, is is not something I can be sure of. But in my own practice, uh, when I keep saying that for me, the space is very important where the person is embedded and that actually creates meaning outside of what someone says at one point in time is where I try and make it quote unquote less artificial. I don't know if that's word I would use, but I, I understand what you're saying. And where does one draw the line and attempt a creative engagement with reality? Um, I don't know. I don't. I want to engage with reality. I might not be representing reality because the, we can't. We cannot. In the way I take my shots and edit them together, I've already created my subjective understanding of reality. Um, so, uh, is it creative? I, I I don't know. But I think it's a very important to understand that. We are not here. We might be here to witness. And in that witnessing, we have something that we express. But that, so is that engagement with reality? Yes, because there is no way we are going to represent reality as is. Um, OK, there's people introducing themselves. So I don't know what that is. Um, so Kashmira Subramanian says, you epitomize the danger of a single story. Uh, yes, uh, uh, the, the reference that you choose is very, very important to me. Um, oh, with utmost sensitivity in your work. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. But yes, for me, the single story is a dangerous one. And a single emotion in a story is also a dangerous one. I'm, I'm perpetually anxious about getting into that zone. Um, Anna, there's uh, my my uh, films. I for this talk, I actually put all my films on my on my website, and the link is there in the in the uh, event notice. 
Um, Ishani Roy was part of the shooting of Bidesia and Bombay. Uh, and she remembers well the difficulties we had, not in shooting, but in trying to make sense of what, what we had shot and what we were shooting. Um, uh, how to decide to make a documentary, or let's say, how do you select the theme for your film? Fozia asked this question. Um, so Fozia, uh, I, I really don't know uh, how do I decide to make a documentary. So as I said, my first film was made when I came out of film school and I wanted to go back into my city, which is Bombay, Mumbai. It was still Bombay at that time. And because a lot of my friends who are both activists and researchers were looking at different aspects of the city, I sort of automatically gone, got drawn there. And this particular space, Jari Mari, uh, seemed to somehow hold all the bundle of ideas I wanted to explore about my city. So that led me to it. But each film of mine, that film led me to my Bangalore film on the garment industry. Uh, each film of mine somehow came to me very differently. Uh, at what point do I decide this is going to be a film? That also that process comes through a lot of reading and engaging with the material. Uh, Suresh uh, asks, when you found that you were researching on the editing table, did it conflict with the script? So Suresh, I don't work with a script. I, as I said, I begin with a very clear set of questions. So it's not as if I went into Jarimari to say I'm making a film on Jarimari. No, I went into Jarimari because I was very clearly wanting to look at uh, what is Bombay like post its history of um, a manufacturing city. Uh, so it was a very clear question I had. But in Jarimari, I ended up filming anything and everything that I encountered. So when I say that my edit table became also the space for my research was when I started trying to make meaning and sense of what I had shot. So the fact that I had gone one evening to interview somebody and in the process I realized that everybody was in a panic because the, the water pipe had broken. And the next day when I went back, I realized that people were still struggling for water. And I began filming that. I didn't quite know how that, that would mean anything in my film. But it was at the editing table that I realized that actually that tell, told me the story of what it means to be a daily wage worker who's, if your work gets pushed out because you are busy getting water or because your house is flooded, uh, then, then, you know, what does that mean? Um, will I ever be part of commercial cinema? Will commercial cinema ever be interested in what I do? I think that's the more relevant question. I will keep making the films I make, but I am not sure commercial cinema is interested in that work. Uh, Isabel uh, asks, how is your process of dislocation different when you already know some of your interview subjects and or when there's a proposed question already? Uh, referring to tracing bylines. Bi Thank you, Isabel. Tracing bylines is actually a slightly different process from all my other films. But to ask this question, I uh, uh, the, the the women I was filming through my most of my films um, were the women I would keep going back to, and they were women I did not have a set set of questions. I would go and I would. I would let conversations emerge. Um, and so dislocation was almost being called for by me. Uh, and I was, I was embracing it. There were people I would go to with very specific questions. And there again, very often my question would be dismissed off as almost irrelevant or the wrong question. And I was very open and actually always very thankful for my questions being rubbished. Uh, and very often, if you see in my films, that also gets included in my editing. I don't know if that answers your question about tracing bylines. Uh, it's a really very different process. So although I had pulled out a clip for tracing bylines because I spoke so much, I am not able to get into it uh, substantially. Uh, Shweta asked, do you ever go back to shooting after you start the process of editing? And what drives that decision if yes? So Shweta, I actually did that only for Bidesia in Bombay, uh, where because that film was shot over a very long period of time, I would shoot something and for months on end not shoot again. And in that time, I would try and look at the material 
and uh, start editing it. So none of those edits stay the way they are in the film currently, but those edits prompted me to constantly go back and shooting, to, uh, to keep shooting. Most other films somehow, uh, for a variety of reasons, I shoot for a long time and then come back and edit for a long time. Uh, so this back and forth happened only in, in one film for me. Um, Anjana asks, where can we watch your work? Uh, also, how do you find funds for your documentaries? Finding funds for, for documentaries is uh, ongoing uh, parallel almost occupation. So um, you're always trying to cobble together some grant here or there while making films. As you can see, my films are not very easily fundable because it's not very clear what the films are about. So it's a very convoluted process, uh, which occupies my mind almost as much as making the films. Uh, Soma, Gup Soma Gupta says, when you go about making a film, do you already have a subject or theme in mind? Yes, I do have a subject and theme very clearly. As I said, I have very clear questions. I'm not going blank. I don't go into uh, a village and say, I'm going to make a film on this village. Why I've entered the village and what I want to see in that village is very clear to me. But then I let the process change how I'm seeing, if, that, if, if that's uh, under, uh, uh, easily understood. Uh, does the process of making a particular film lead to making another? Yes. Uh, in fact, one of the nicest things that I really enjoyed putting together my very scattered thoughts for this talk was how actually uh, every film of mine has informed the next film, not just in terms of theme, but also in the, in the process of filmmaking in my film language. So my most recent film, I can see certain decisions I've taken in response to something I've done 15 years ago. Uh, Samira says, tell us something about your growing interest in music. Also, do you feel that the connection between cin cinema and music as art forms influences the form that your work takes? Um, so my growing interest in music actually was sparked off because of a very close association and collaboration with Tejaswini Niranjana, who's, who's a, a, a writer and academic. Um, and she, as I said, Jahaji Music was my first film on music. She uh, had this pro project in which she asked me to document uh, a part of that project. And uh, after fattening myself up on all my secondary research, I'm a very diligent secondary research person before I get into the film, um, I actually uh, decided that I would, of course, document because that's what I'm constantly doing. But that I also wanted to make a film, which is when I chose to actually use my documentation money to, to take a crew. And the crew was Ramani and uh, RV Ramani and Suresh Rajamani. And um, that film and that collaboration with, with Tejaswini has led me to make more films on music. So Bidesi and Bombay came straight out of Jahaji music. When I came back to Bombay, I was curious about in uh, uh, Jahaji music, I was looking at the, the Bhojpuri community in the Caribbean who had traveled back uh, 150 years ago. But when I came back to Bombay, I went into looking at the Bhojpuri community, which was under attack from the right wing groups in Bombay at that time, uh, to look at their musical culture. And then I suddenly realized that the musical culture told me much more about my city than, let's say, my own work in Jari Mari, which I was also trying to understand my city. So, uh, you know, the fact that music is another art form, yes. But more importantly, music has a certain temporality that it imposes on the way I film and the way I edit and the way I listen and the way my relationship with sound has actually changed dramatically because of that connection. So I'm, I hope I've answered your question, Samira. Uh, I think we are running out of time. Um, do I have deadlines to meet? Luckily, because I know, except for one or two occasions, most, uh, I haven't got clear funding for my films. I cobbled together little, little uh, grants. So I, it's unfortunate that I don't have deadlines because that means I spend years over my film, which is not a very good professional uh, and economical way of working. Um, how do your respondents, uh, Susan uh, Vishwanathan, how do your respondents react to your film? Uh, Susan, it's been a, re a really uh, long and I think enriching learning process. Every film uh, 
the people in my film have responded very differently it's hard for me to sort of generalize it because literally each film has actually given me more insight and more uh, uh more reflection on my own like what why why am i doing what i'm doing um there hasn't been a moment where uh, somebody who's in my film has rejected my film uh, um you know um or said that you know you have misrepresented us also because i very often have shown my rough cuts at different stages uh, depending on which film i'm talking about there are some films where i just didn't have access to the people while editing but almost everybody yeah actually almost everybody has seen my film the people who have in my film um it's sorry i'm really it's hard to generalize but i think their comments and their responses or their questions back to me is really the most important learning for me to go to the next film um i'm sorry i'm being really vague in answering your question but each film has a different story um it's 5:30 uh, it's 7 o'clock i think we uh how can you choose or decide the idea so lots of people anusha has also asked oh anusha has asked the same question twice anusha um so i it's a, it's a very glib line to say and I, i i it's not a good thing to say it in a glib way but sama i think films choose me um it's because i might be reading in a particular direction that i start becoming curious about making a film or sometimes it is uh the work and my collaborations and conversations with the people around me many of whom are researchers writers academics that lead me to my film so again sorry for sounding glib but uh i have not got uh i think we are running out of time i know we are way over time but yeah have i missed out any question mm, i don't think so um Yeah so I think uh, um yeah I think this might be a good time to say a big thank you to the audience who have been here thank you so much um my films as i said are available on my website that's uh, uh you'll have to google surabhi sharma wordpress and you'll come to my blog which has all my films um Ah uh, I've got a thank you from Samira so it's uh, so yes so thank you so much to the audience for being here uh I I do hope that I was somehow able to connect the dots since my films insist on not connecting the dots but actually uh knotting up the knots further uh I have a feeling my my talk was a lot like that but thank you so much uh, to CDC uh Oh, ramani has a question mm ramani says why not four dimensionality ramani i shall think about it um and yeah i shall think about it um thank you so much to the creative documentary course for those who are uh, students or interested in filmmaking uh, i'm going to sort of seriously uh, urge you and pitch for this absolutely lovely course uh thank you bhasmang for putting this together thank you malika for putting this together and uh, of course thank you samira jain for even asking me to try and put some thoughts together about my films and and my work um thank you so much